Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. It's the morning after the night before Arsenal embarrassed, humiliated, beaten in Baku and miss out on the chance to qualify for the Champions League as well as passing up the opportunity to win our first European trophy in 25 years. I don't know about you guys, feeling dejected this morning, uh, really disappointed, uh, fed up and glad that we've got a break from the Arsenal now for a, for a couple of months or so. Um, my guest this morning to dissect that utter shit show in Baku is a man who was in the team the last time Arsenal tasted European glory. It's none other than Nigel Winterburn. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, Mr. <laughs> Nigel Winterburn. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm OK this morning. I think that's as best as I can put it. Yeah. I know how you're feeling, mate. I've woken up <laughs> as though I've been hit by a train in my sleep. I feel terrible. Uh, what are your overall thoughts, your overriding feelings before we get into the detail, before we dissect what was obviously a disappointing night? Uh, what are your overriding feelings coming away from, from last night's game? Well, a huge disappointment. I think there was uh, obviously a massive opportunity there for, for the team to win a trophy back into the Champions League. First half, I thought, was OK. I thought was fairly even. We kept Chelsea fairly quiet as a attacking force, um, but quite simply didn't turn up in that second half. And uh, it was uh, a performance that reminded me of too many that we've had away from home this season since Christmas. And that's very, very disappointing. Absolutely. I mean... Looking at the team that started, and we know that there were certain players that were missing. We know that Mkhitaryan couldn't travel or didn't want to travel based on what was going on, and that's fair enough. We know that Aaron Ramsey was injured and ultimately leaving for Juventus. We know, you know, there was constant injuries that have sort of plagued us towards the end of the season. But I thought that Unai Emery's selection was the right one, and I can't sit here now and say Unai got it wrong because he picked the team that I picked a couple of days ago. Would you say that's fair? Do you think that Unai Emery did as much as he could in terms of the team selection? Yeah, I don't think... Um, I think if you look down the, the, the team selection last night, I don't think too many people would have been questioning his selection. Obviously, before the game was the big debate with Petr Cech and uh, Leno. But, um, you know, I said all along that I didn't see why the manager would change when you trusted a goalkeeper all the way through the competition to get you to the final. Why would you change uh, when you've almost paid your... It's wrong to call Czech a second keeper, but in terms of where he was at Arsenal at that moment in time, he was the second choice keeper because Leno was number one. But once you play somebody um, like Petr Cech all the way through, there's no way you're going to leave him out for the final just because you've got there. I have to say he had an outstanding game and he's probably one of the players that you wouldn't lay any criticism on. So... Um, that was one of the debates. I don't think in really any other areas, most Arsenal supporters would have debated the, the team selection. So, yeah, I think, he, I think he got it right. I just feel that the, uh, the team, particularly in that second half, just didn't perform. I mean, what could have gone wrong, though, between the first half and the second half? Because like you said, in the first half, you know, particularly at the, in the early stages, we looked by far the more comfortable side. We were knocking the ball around nicely. We were exposing Chelsea on the flanks. Kalasinac and Maitland-Niles were getting forward to good effect. Unfortunately, the final ball wasn't quite there. But what could have gone wrong at half time? What goes on in the dressing room that means a team come out sort of so lacklustre and, and it was a final, wasn't it? That was really disappointing for me. Yeah, it's really difficult to, to say. I mean, I've been in dressing rooms before. Fortunately, I've been part of some fantastic teams that have won a lot of trophies. I mean, occasionally when it does go wrong, particularly in a game of that calibre where there was nothing between the two teams. Chelsea started well. Arsenal had the middle period. Chelsea finished quite well. And at half-time, your focus is really on what you want to try and carry on to achieve your right. Wide areas, for me, were key for us. Um, just not quite right on our selection of delivery. We just couldn't pick out the right pass at the end. But it was OK. And then it was as if when we came out, the focus was not right. It was as if we were asleep. Chelsea came at us. And the worrying fact for me that I've talked about a lot all season is, is 
when we can see the goal, a lot of the time we don't have or don't seem to be able to have the ability to regroup, recollect, clear our thoughts and then say, right, we must stay in the game now for the next 15 minutes um, as we progress through that second half and let's see if we can work our way back into it. But all of a sudden we can see the first one and then we're 3-0 down, 19, I think 19 minutes gone into the, to the second half. You can't, professional football is, is ruthless. There's not many occasions you're going to come back into a game uh, when you when you do that at, at the start of a, a, a second half period, and that was what was so disappointing for me. Absolutely. Um, you, your former teammate Martin Keown was was quite vocal on BT Sport after the game, saying that he felt that it was a problem. The fact that our defence keeps changing in terms of the system. You know, one week it's a back three, sometimes it's a back four. You know, does that as a defender and as someone who's been there? Is that a problem? Does that cause you to be unsettled? Is it difficult to get into any sort of rhythm or you know understanding of your positions when you're being asked to change it so often? Because that has happened a lot this season. Yeah, I th- well, yes, it can. I agree with Martin to a to a certain degree, but I think even he will accept that uh, in the modern game, and we did it ourselves occasionally. We switch from a four to a five. It's all about, for me, it's more about having the understanding of what it means when you're in and out of possession with a defender, where your weaknesses are, uh, what you need to do individually and collectively to stop the opposition obviously scoring against you. And uh, I'm still not convinced if you're just looking, let's say, at the Arsenal back four or back five, that they are ruthless enough in stopping the opposition in one against one uh, situations. For me, it drives me bad, mad with our with our wing backs or our full backs when you get the opposition in wide areas and we don't stop enough enough crosses. I'm always shouting at the telly, stop the cross, first point of danger, don't let the cross come into the box. And we we seem to be, or we've never been taught those players that actually that's the first point of danger. That ball goes into the box, that's a potential goal against you. And uh, I don't see that urgency within the team to to stop that. The second point I have to, and you know, I have to sort of defend the defenders slightly as well, is that I would hate to be a defender in this current Arsenal team because the protection at times in front of them is non-existent. Yeah, uh, that. and that must be so so frustrating. But then I can flip it back and say. With those defenders, they should be balling at those midfield players and forwards in front of them, getting them back, getting them into a solid line, concede a bit of possession for, for a couple of minutes if you have to, but just make sure you've got that organisation and you're not going to let Chelsea create any more chances. And um, unfortunately, uh, we've seen too often this season and last season, to be fair, um, that particularly I keep uh, stressing it away from home, um, those those qualities uh, have, have been lacking. And I think for me, that's the disappointing thing. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with any of that. And, you know, talking about the, the defence in particular while we're on that subject, I mean, Ainsley Maitland-Niles, for me, has had a few poor games towards the end of the season in those full-back positions. He doesn't... It, it, it's harsh to, to judge him on that because we know that he's not been brought up as a, a full-back. And you'll be able to tell us, Nigel, that is a position that you need to know inside out, isn't it? It's not easy to just go from being a centre midfielder to being relied upon as a, a right back or a right wing back. Do you think he's kind of been a little bit uh, unfortunate in the, the circumstances because it, it kind of reflects poorly on him and I kind of sit here and I'm reluctant to slag him off because I don't think that it's entirely fair and it's not all of his own making. Yeah. To be fair, I'm not I'm not a uh, I'm not a big big lover of um picking out individual players and criticising them. I actually thought that Maitland-Niles and Kalashnikov in the first half were doing a good job. Agreed. You know, it was just maybe the final delivery. Hazard was fairly quiet. You've got to say that. But that in the second half is where we, uh, sort of where we struggled. Listen, if you are, the best way to describe it is if you are a uh, potential midfield player wing back, but you don't fully know or have been taught the role of how to play it, then you are, even if you are 
a top fullback or wing back, you make the odd mistake. Yeah. But if you've never been taught the rights and wrongs of playing in those different positions, then you it, it you know sometimes it can it can it can expose you, um, and you have to try try and deal with it. Now, obviously, I'm not privy to what the uh, the players are doing in, in in training. I have no involvement in that whatsoever. But you know. I'm saying already said it to you yeah. before we had the conversation of, uh, about individual players is that the fullbacks and the wingbacks frustrate me because I don't think they fully understand the fullback role or or the wingback role in defensive areas. I have no problems with them going forward. It's the defensive areas that really uh, concern me, and and that's getting close and tight to a winger putting him under pressure, trying to push him away from goal, trying to slow him down, trying to make, you know, if you're going to beat me, you're going to beat me with individual brilliance, but at all costs. Yeah. Not just, I'm going to drop my shoulder and go past you and whip the ball in, and it doesn't matter because someone in the middle might head the ball away or they might not. No, you have to have your mental attitude has to be, if this guy beats me one-on-one, that is a potential goal. And I'm not sure, as I said to you before, and I'll reiterate it, we are ruthless enough in those areas. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You make some fantastic points. And for me, and I know, obviously, you don't want to go into individual players, but for me, what frustrates me is the fact that I feel like Ainsley Maitland-Niles has kind of been thrown under a bus by being asked to do that job. I feel like, you know, for a club that are always telling us about the, the problems we have sort of in the wage bill and the fact that we can't compete, why are we paying somebody like Stefan Lichsteiner what we're paying him to, to not play? For me, he, you know, I don't think he's good enough, but that's another matter. But the point is, why did we bring him in if he's not good enough to do that job? And, and we're having to play a 21-year-old central midfielder in there. And, and ultimately, I think we're, we're really holding him back in his development. And that really frustrates me as a fan. Now... Again, we don't want to talk about individuals. It's it's really difficult not to do so, though, when you're seeing so much criticism of certain players flying around on social media, flying around everywhere. Uh, Mesut Ozil's attitude has come into question again. Uh, I don't think he was to blame for last night's defeat, do you? No, he wasn't, he wasn't to blame. I mean, as I said to you, there was... Um... There was so many poor performances, particularly in that second half, that um, you could have listed the whole team, uh, probably apart from Petr Cech, if, I, if I'm honest with you. And you could have, if you wanted to, if you was a manager in the dressing room and you were ruthless, you probably could have pointed the finger at every single one of them. But I think for me, the bigger issue is um, I'm tending to not forget about last night's game, but I'm look, I've am look. i looked at last season under Arsene Wenger and I looked at this season under... Um, uh, Unai Emery, and I'm looking and thinking, this for me was almost like a pre-season for Unai Emery. He knows now, or he should know, because a lot of the supporters can see it, that we have put in too many um, poor performances in uh, away, particularly away games. You, you've been so good at home, and your away, your away performances are so far away your home performances uh, that he he now has a good idea of what he needs to do to start to revamp the squad. Now, the squad has to be changed. I don't think you you or anybody else will disagree with that. And that's up to Unai Emery to go to the board and say, I've got to start to redevelop this squad. My worry is how much money have we got? And my gut feeling is that when he came in, this was a three-year turnover period for Arsenal because of what I was hearing in terms of money available to the club contracts that are players are, that are on that they're on and how can if if you don't want them how do you get rid of them you know move them on because they're on such good money um so i thought mm, this could be this could be three years so i think we might start to see a turnaround in players coming and going at the start of next season but you're not going to see five or six players leaving and five or six players coming in 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 in, in august if you if if you do i think we might be a bit delusional and I think it's going to take another two years for the manager to move out the players that he doesn't want who doesn't fit into his system and bring the players back in who he thinks he can work with so it might be a time that he has to reassess after this final 
and say, do you know what? I might have to even go with a little bit like George Graham did. I might have to go and search down a little bit in the championship and I might have to bring in the likes of Reese Nelson and uh, Joe Willock, give them the opportunity to say, right, we are the future of Arsenal. Um, can, and then the manager says, right, can you take us forward next season? Let's see, let's see if you're good enough. And then reevaluate again at the end of next season. I mean, it's so frustrating. But, you know, you have to realise where we are. We are a long way from where we want to be. Um, we have to accept that. But the only way forward is to, to start churning around the squad and, and move some players on, uh, bring some new ones in. But also, it might be time to bring in a couple of younger players to see whether they're good enough as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I totally accept that the problems run a lot deeper than than Unai Emery. He's not the, the sole issue. For me, though, if I'm being completely honest, where I kind of struggle a little bit with Emery and it, it is that I don't really see what the vision is. I don't see a system and then, you know, where I can say, right, this is what he's trying to do. Therefore, in the summer, he needs to go and get X, Y and Z. I feel like we've chopped and changed too many times this season. And I feel that's disrupted our continuity. Now, me personally, I am not sure that Unai Emery is the man that will be able to get us through this period. And and I, am I being unfair in saying that? Um, yes, at this moment in time, I think you, you, you are, although... You may find already after a frustrated end to the season, a lot of people are agreeing with you. But what I would say is, is what we don't know and we're trying to judge from the outside, and even I'm working at Arsenal, I don't know, is how much is his hands tied? You can dis- We can dis- debate whether we should stick to one system or we should be able to play two. Do we chop and change? Does the manager make too many changes too early? A lot of people said... Oh, when he first came in, he made those changes that were decisive. Oh, Arsene Wenger never did that till about 70 minutes and he always made the same changes. So it's just where it's gone wrong. I think particularly towards the second half of the season, people are now starting to say, oh, we're making too many changes. For me, I think we, we have to try and assess what, what we've got to spend uh, on players coming in. It, obviously, at the start of this season just gone, just finished, to me, it looked very limited when you look at what we brought in. Um, and now we have to look again. So this is where I'm, I'm looking and thinking, right, well, if you can if you can only bring in, again, a limited number of players, let's say you can only bring in two players, we need to make probably more changes than two to get out of this habit where we're too easy to beat. So what do we have to do to try and change that? Maybe it's time to bring in, as I just said, a couple of the younger players. We're not sure whether they are good enough, but unless we give them the chance, we're not going to know. And then at least you have that plan right. So I've got two younger players coming in. I've got two new signings. That's four players I've got into this squad that have completely changed the squad around already. And let's see where we let's see where we are going through the start of next season and into January transfer window. And then I can re- reassess again. But I agree with you. It's it's very frustrating. Um, we're not, as I keep saying to you, we're not where we all want to be. We want to be back up and challenging top four and trying to eventually challenge for the title. But at this moment in time, we're a long, long way away from there. So let's see if we can at least look like we are making some progression with, in terms of squad turnaround. Because I think that's the only way we are we are going to make some progression, if I'm honest with you. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. And I mean, uh, don't don't take this the wrong way. I'm not saying that Unai Emery is a bad manager or uh, or anything like that. It's just that, like you said, there are so many factors at Arsenal that are causing us issues at the moment. And I feel like it needs... You need to go back to the drawing board, in my opinion, and, and have a clear plan and a clear philosophy and a way of moving forward and building on. And I've just... You know, maybe it's because he doesn't have the players he wants. Maybe it's because he feels that this is the way he can get results. But for me, it is a little bit frustrating to see a different team, a different system and and no clear vision. You know, Klopp came into Liverpool and I know he spent more money and et cetera, et cetera. But you could see from day one what he was trying to implement. You could see what Guardiola was trying to implement. 
And I know you can't make the comparison directly because of the funds these teams have available. But, you know, you can look down the road at Tottenham and as much as it pains me to say it, Pochettino has a way of playing. He has a style. And over the years, he's managed to assemble a team that can execute that. And lo and behold, they're in the Champions League final. Whereas we just seem to be, you know, mixing and matching. And maybe Unai will get it right. And, and it, there's a good chance he will. It's just right now, I can't handle my heart, sit there and say... 100% he is the right man. That's just kind of where I'm sitting at the moment. Yeah, I fully understand with what you're saying. And listen, I'm not going to argue with anybody that says, mm, I'm not sure if he's the right manager for us. What I, what I will reiterate is, is at this moment in time, he may have put in a plan that we are struggling to see in terms of maybe he wanted to go with a back four. So his plan was, it looked like to me, he wanted to go back four with a high press. Yeah. All of a sudden, you lose uh, Rob Holding, and you you say Rob Holding was our most consistent at the start of last season, and most uh, this season. Sorry, just finished our most consistent centre half. Uh, you've got Bellerin in there, we lost as well. All of a sudden, he goes, you know what? I don't think with the, what I've got left, I can play with a back four. I've got to go to a back five. All of a sudden, my plan has to change. I go to a back five. Oh, well, at times we're not creating enough. I go back to my back four. I go back to my back four, but it looks like we're going to concede a goal every time a team attacks against us. As a manager, I think that must be very, very frustrating as well. So I'm I'm assuming and I'm pretty sure that he's got a plan, but that plan may take quite a while to come to practice and to see because obviously he's limited to uh, play a turnaround at, at this moment in time. So, um, you know, I would say let's let's see where we are uh, at the end of next season. Let's see what if the squad is very, very similar, what the results are like, and particularly away from home, because that's my big concern. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, the last two years, we've been well off the pace away from home. Uh, and let's see where we are from there. But... Um, it's. I, I think at the moment with the emotions running very high, it's it's, it's very difficult for Unai Emery as well. And uh, you know, you'll uh, as you've you've said, you'll have to say a lot of people will be. He hasn't had a lot of time, uh, and some people will say, but I haven't seen much difference this season. Although we got to the Europa League final in terms of our defensive stability, those positions both ways, whichever you support, are hard to argue with really. So, yeah. unfortunately, it's a case of. Let's just, we've got to wait and see. In modern world, we don't want to wait and see. We want to see progression every single game. Unfortunately, sometimes you go backwards to go forwards. Uh, let's hope that, that that is the case. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of people have been talking about what this means, what missing out on Champions League football again means to the club. There's lots of talk around the transfer budget. You know, Raul and Vinay put out those videos last week where they were talking about their ambitions for the club and that Arsenal belong in the Champions League. In your opinion, and I know you're not privy to, to this sort of information, but in your opinion, what does missing out on the Champions League mean to this club? Uh, well, if you're playing against top opposition right in terms of playing, because that's really what I'm all my, I'm interested in. When I'm a player, I want to play against the best players. The best players are usually playing in the, the Champions League. Uh, for the club, I would think in terms of revenue turnover, uh, is, is going to be massively down again. So that's a big issue. But um, sometimes you've got to uh, speculate to accumulate. Uh, and the one worrying thing, I think, from my point of view is that I keep hearing, unless we get in the Champions League, we haven't got much money to spend. Well, we need to spend some money to be give us a fantastic opportunity to get back into the, <laughs> the Champions League because I actually thought our best chance was this season. I it thought we had an unbelievable. It? it opened up unbelievably with the last eight or nine games. It was there. It was sitting on a plate waiting to be taken, and unfortunately, we couldn't go. We we, we couldn't go. We couldn't go through and 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 finish it off. And my big concern is that if we haven't got that money to spend, uh, well, Chelsea are on an embargo at the moment, but Manchester United are probably going to be. Well, they are. I don't know. Probably they are going to make some significant signings through the summer. Uh, and you're going to find that Man City and Liverpool are so far ahead of the rest at the moment. Tottenham will probably, with their new stadium, uh, and Pochettino saying, you know, we need to take, not the next step, but we need to start some investment into the squad. So they're going to go again. 
Uh, and at the moment, we're looking the ones that are looking a little bit frail and thinking, where where are we going here? Are we just going to be, are we going to be sitting around fifth and sixth for the next two or three seasons? So that's why I say it's so important to to try and see what what the clear vision is in terms of playing staff is for for next season. And and really, that's what I'm more interested in. I'm not I'm not interested in how much money Arsenal are making or how much they're losing. I'm an ex-player, and I'm only interested in what the team are are trying to trying to trying to achieve. Now I know one affects the other, but I'm just looking at performances and and thinking and judging it against all the rest of the teams and thinking we've got a lot of ground to make up somehow. And uh, if we can't do it by making uh, big big signings, then we need to go and have a look around uh, in the Championship uh, and and maybe abroad in some of the leagues and thinking. Can I pick some players up just to rotate the squad? But are young, are enthusiastic, who you know want to maybe be able to step up to to the next level. That's what George Graham did with 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 the team that he eventually um, brought through. Homegrowns players from lower leagues uh, with one or two experienced players at, at the club um, made it hard work and difficult to beat. But brought some passion back to the football club, and um, maybe maybe we might need to, rather than looking at the silky fancy football, we might be looking at a couple more years uh, like that again, which you know I think people would support if you see that there's real desire and energy going into those performances. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, and I I think with the young players it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because given the way the football landscape is now, they they're under so much pressure so early, and when they come into a team like Arsenal, they're expected to deliver straight away. And and like you said earlier on in the show, it's very difficult to know exactly how good some of these players are until we see them playing with regularity, and 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 that's kind of a risk as well from the manager's part. Now, as a, a manager coming from abroad. For example, you know, you, you don't really know much about the youth setup. You know that you've only got two years to prove yourself. Would you take that risk? Would you go and give someone a chance? Or would you just pluck someone from abroad that you you know more about? It, it's, it's all about taking risks as a manager, isn't it? Yes, it is. But, um, you know, plucking someone from abroad for how much? You know, we are talking about not having a, a lot of money. So, to me, I'd, I'd probably go, right, well, if we've only got a limited amount of money, I'd probably, I would probably be thinking, do you know what? If I could guarantee one player that I could get that would make a significant difference to my squad, rather than splitting it and taking two or three, and then I'll chuck in my younger players and take the risk, because young players should bring energy to the team. You should demand that the one, the one ingredient they will bring is hard work and energy. And if yeah. they don't bring that, you know straight away they're not the young players are not going to develop at Arsenal. Yeah. So you know that straight away that that's going to happen. So um, that's why I'm saying for me, yeah, you know, it's 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 a disappointing end to the season because it could have with the league and the cup, you know, we had two opportunities really to get back into Champions League. It could have it could have been so so different to a, such a 45 minutes if if you like and six games away from end at the end of the season's really sort of derailed it and everyone's sort of thinking, where are we going to go? But um, I'm, I'm sure in the next few days, I'll be turning my attentions to what Unai Emery is going to do and, and see what, what rumours are flying around in terms of players coming in, players going out and then getting ready for, for, for the new season to, to have a look at hopefully well, what will be a, a, a slightly different Arsenal team to the one that we we see finish the other night. Absolutely, and just finally, Nigel, I want to get your thoughts on the the Olivier Giroud situation. Obviously, we let him go. It, we kind of had to to get Aubameyang in, and over the course of the season, you know, Aubameyang scored plenty of goals. So I don't think anybody's really complaining about that. There are some Arsenal fans today, though, that are really slating Giroud because he's celebrating winning the Europa uh, UEFA Europa League trophy. Now, for me. You know, you're an ex-player. You'll be. You would have played against former clubs. I mean, surely he's got every right to celebrate winning a major trophy. Well, you have. What you have to uh, understand is that we are, uh, as supporters, we are passionate about our team, and we're only interested really in our team. And when you see an ex-player celebrating 
it really grates with you because you will have magic moments with, or hopefully you've had magic moments celebrating, particularly with Giroud scoring those goals. I think what I have to say to you is players are ruthless. They are professional. And I would also could flip that round and say, you know what? He's just won a Europa League final with the team that he's joined. If he didn't celebrate, then to me, there is something wrong with uh, Olivier Giroud. If you cannot celebrate winning a trophy, um, What's then the point? <laughs> the, what is what is the point? You might as you might as well not uh, not have moved. So I don't agree with with those supporters that are giving him stick. Listen, I may come into some criticism. If it was me, I would celebrate against my former team because I have a duty. I know I found it very, very difficult to uh, when I went to West Ham, yeah. when I played against Arsenal. I can tell you for sure there is, if I had to put my body on the line against one of my mates at Arsenal, um, particularly came up down that left-hand side, right-hand side against Lee Dixon, yeah. uh, Freddie Lundberg or whoever playing Henri on the, who drifted out times to the right-hand side. If I had to, for my team, put them into the stand, I would have done it. <laughs> Exactly. Fortunately for the Arsenal supporters and Arsenal team, they were far better than the team I was playing for. <laughs> but that, but this is where you have to realise that if we are be going to come back to be a top team, that is the mentality that your player has to have in terms of a never say die attitude. And you know what? I've earned the right against my former team to celebrate. Yes. I did personally don't want to sit. I didn't. I turned it straight off. I don't want to sit and watch Chelsea uh, celebrating, particularly Oliver Giroud, who's been part of Arsenal and has been fantastic for the club. But I cannot deny him or criticise him on social media for enjoying that moment. As a professional player, that to me is is completely wrong. That's what we play professional football for. We're in a privileged position. Uh, in terms of what we give back to our supporters. And when we win, and when we pick up trophies, we come together as one to celebrate. So there's no way that I can criticise him for, for doing what he, what he did. Yep, completely agree. Nigel, what, what are your plans for the summer now? Season's over. Uh, it's time to put the feet up and, and relax and switch off from football for a little bit. Uh, well, I try to switch off as much as I can from football, you know, <laughs> at times as well. You know, I, I, I follow Arsenal quite a bit with the terms of work that I do for for the club. But, yeah, I've got one or two sort of quirky little things that, that I do that I'll be uh, spending a bit more time doing uh, th through the summer. So, uh, yeah, just uh, and also but just keeping track of really what's happening in the transfer market and li listening for little snippets from, from Arsenal to see... Um, what is going to what is going to happen? Because obviously, as we've talked about, there is a lot of frustration around our football club at this moment in time. But um, you know, we've got to uh, we've got to stay positive, which is difficult at the moment. And uh, we we hopefully, well, I'm hopeful that we'll see a slightly different lineup to our team than uh, than what we've seen this season. Because that means to me that the manager has realised that certain things have got to change. Yeah, absolutely. Nigel, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you again. Thank you for coming back on the show. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't be talking about a Europa League victory, which is sad and disappointing. But it's been a great conversation and I really appreciate your insight. So thanks once again for joining us. And I'm sure our listeners are going to love it. Yeah, no problems. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of another podcast. Huge thanks to Arsenal legend Nigel Winterburn for joining me and providing us with plenty of fantastic insight. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, hit like, hit share, uh, leave your comments below and we'll be back tonight with the fans phoning. If you want to get involved, all you need to do is tweet us at Chronicles underscore AFC, uh, DM us on Twitter, sorry, uh, and we will pick up your details and we'll be in touch uh, and let you know how you can jump on and have your say on uh, last night's disappointing defeat. Until then, guys, take care.